wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from the thechrisvossshow.com, thechrisvossshow.com. Hey, we're wonderful. Another podcast we've got going on. We're very thankful to have you coming in again. Thanks, guys, for coming by. Be sure to subscribe to the show. I don't know where the wonderful came from. We just feel really wonderful today. Do you feel wonderful, Michael? Oh, very wonderful. Mike, he, he can't even hold himself back. He's so excited to be here. <laughs> we'll be talking to Michael here in a second. But in the meantime, you want to see the video version of this, go to, let's see, youtube.com forward slash Chris Voss. How do I forget that? Goodreads.com forward slash Chris Voss. See everything we're reading and reviewing over there. And also go to Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. There's just an endless monolith of, uh, of uh, groups over there that you can go and look at. And monolith, is that the right word? I, who gave me a book deal? Anyway, guys, monolith. We just put funny stuff at the beginning of the show to make it interesting for you guys. So we're excited to announce my new book is coming out. It's called Beacons of Leadership, Inspiring Lessons of Success in Business and Innovation. It's going to be coming out on October 5th, 2021. And I'm really excited for you to get a chance to read this book. It's filled with a multitude of my insightful stories, lessons, my life, and experiences in leadership and character. I give you some of secrets from my CEO entrepreneur toolbox that I use to scale my business success, innovate, and build a multitude of companies. I've been a CEO for, uh, what is it, like uh, 33, 35 years now. We talk about leadership, the importance of leadership, how to become a great leader, and how anyone can become a great leader as well. So you can pre-order the book right now wherever fine books are sold, but the best thing to do on getting a pre-order deal is to go to beaconsofleadership.com. That's beaconsofleadership.com. On there, you can find several packages you can take advantage of in ordering the book and for the same price of what you can get it from someplace else like amazon you can get all sorts of extra goodies that we've taken and given away uh different collectors limited edition custom made numbered book plates that are going to be autographed by me there's all sorts of other goodies that you can get when you buy the book from beaconsofleadership.com so be sure to go there check it out or order the book wherever fine books are sold anyway guys we have a most amazing author on the show and he uh, probably knows how to pick better words than i do at the beginning of shows he's the author author of the new book. It's coming out October 5th, 2021. The book is called Spies and Traitors. Kim Philby, James Angleton, and the friendship and betrayal that would shape MI6, the CIA, and the Cold War. His name is Michael Holzman. He's going to be talking about this. This is exciting considering the James Bond movies coming out, MI6, all that good stuff. Michael was born in Brookings, South Dakota. He's the author of James, Jesus, Angleton, The CIA and the Craft of Intelligence, biographies of Guy Burgess and Donald and Melinda McLean, and the novel Pax, 1934 to 41. He lives in uh, Briar Cliff Manor, New York, and that might be Pax, 1934 to 41. Is that correct, uh, Michael? That's right. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. We're just testing you. Thank you. Testing you to see if you knew the title of your own book. It's a rough comedy day to hear this uh, work in this room today. Michael, thank you for coming by. Congratulations on your book. Uh, books are a lot of work, but we certainly appreciate you coming by and sharing it and all the time you put into it. Give us your plug so people can find you on the interwebs, please. The book is coming out from Pegasus Press, mm -hmm. and it's available on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And Actually, all my books are available on Amazon. There you go. How many books do you have, by the way? Seven or eight. Yeah. And if you go on YouTube, you can see he's got several thousand behind him, I think, on his bookshelf. So he's a very well-read gentleman. I'm jelly of your library there. What motivates you want to write this book, Michael? I had written a biography of James Angleton. And I had noticed that he had gotten uh, very wound up with Kim Philby. I had actually acquired some more information. The CIA has been releasing information that they say is about the JFK assassination. Mm. And they release this information by backing a truck up to Langley and filling it with files and then dumping them. So mm -hmm. they're in no order whatsoever. 
Oh, wow. I went through those and I found out that not only were they about the Kennedy assassination, but they were about everything that the CIA had done mm -hmm. uh, randomly. I went through and I found out that there was a lot more information about Angleton and I needed to update that. Awesome. Awesome. So who are these characters? Give us a basis of who these characters are for those who aren't familiar with uh, these names. Okay. Well, this has, um, this gets pretty deep in, into secret intelligence service. See, most countries have organizations that spy on other countries. Uh, probably every country has organizations that spy on other countries. And then within those organizations, they have organizations that try to prevent other countries from spying on. The first of these was the Indian Intelligence Service of the Brits. And they used their secret intelligence service in India to keep the people in India from becoming independent. Mm -hmm. And the famous book about this is Chem by Roger Kipling. The, the Brits then took this home and they set up secret intelligence services in England just before the Second World War. Mm -hmm. There was one that was to keep the empire and the people at home in line. They called that MI5. And then there was one to spy on everybody else. They called that MI6. <laughs> uh, when the Second World War started, the United States had none of these things. Mm. And they needed somebody to teach them how to do it because they didn't want to be left out. So they set up the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, and sent people over to England to learn how to be spies. Mm. The spy craft. I think it's important to realize that a spy is not a technical term. What you have mm. are civil servants who have pensions and regular salaries and so on. Those are officers. Angleton mm -hmm. and Philby were both officers. And then you have agents who the officers employ. Mm -hmm. And they don't have anything except death benefits for their beneficiaries. Oh, wow. That's probably not a good thing either if you're having to cash in your death benefits, right? Yeah. Among the, that data, I found a lot of these forms that people had filled out saying, yes, I accept the, to work with the CIA and my grandmother should get the honorarium when I'm killed. Now, are these the type of CIA, CIA people that you see that are usually unnamed on the wall of I forget the name, the, the Wall of Honor or whatever. At where, Langley, yeah. At Langley, they're just a star. There's not no, a name. Those are the officers. Oh, okay. Those are the employees. The the agents uh, have an unmarked grave. Okay. Wow. You don't even get a marked grave. Wow. <laughs> Geez, that's there's the honor in that. Nice, nice. Give us an overall arcing of the, the book or some details that you think that uh, we can tease out to readers to get them to go buy it. Okay, once I got interested in, in doing this, writing a dual biography of Angleton and Philby, I went into it. And what you have is that, as I said, with an employee of MI6, the Foreign Service, Secret Intelligence Service of the Brits. Mm -hmm. um, he had a very interesting background. He was born in India. That's what they called him, Kemp, after the book by Kipling. His father had been a British agent who had worked in India and then had worked in Iraq. And at a certain point, he was told to go to, South, to Arabia. It wasn't Saudi Arabia. Then. It was before the First World War. Mm -hmm. And make friends with a chieftain there who was called Ibn Saud. Mm -hmm. And he did. And then he spent the rest of his life promoting the career of Ibn Saud, who became king of Saudi Arabia. Oh, wow. And also Philby, Kim Philby's father, whose name was Sinjin Philby, uh, became famous as an explorer. Mm -hmm. And he was parallel to T.E. Lawrence of Arabia. So oh, wow. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia was supporting a fellow named Hussein, and Sinjin Philby was supporting Ibn and. I went to the archives in London once, and I found these big books that were the memoranda, the, the reports that Lawrence had written and that Philby had written, since that Philby had written. It was very thrilling. There was a story about the father, and I decided to look at oh, Kim Philby, and I decided to look at the father, of James Angleton, and he turned out to have a completely different thing. He was born from absolutely dirt poor farmers in Indiana. He went west to make his fortune. He went to Idaho near you, Boise. And this was before the First World War. And he went into what was then high tech, which was cash registers. 
and he got a job selling cash registers, a national uh, cash register company. And he went from there with absolutely nothing to become head of the largest American company in Italy. Oh, wow. Head of the American Chamber of Commerce in Italy. So his son, James Angleton, grew up in a palace in Milan and then was sent off to private schools in England, went to Yale. Mm -hmm. So that was the beginning there. So you have these very interesting father stories that then wow. tie into the sons. Now, this is interesting. James and Kim, they were friends for six years, and then they become enemies. So this is kind of an interesting spy tale, isn't it? Yeah, I should think so. So what happens then is that James Angleton is sent to London to learn how to be a spy, and his teacher is Kim Philby. Mm -hmm. And Kim Philby remains his mentor for a number of years. They work together in London against the Germans. Then Angleton is sent to Rome to work against the fascists there. And all the time he's asking Philby for advice. What do I do in this situation? Do I shoot this fascist? Or do I, do I capture him and, and uh, milk him for information? What should I do? At the end of the war, Kim Philby is made head of anti-Soviet work for MI6. This is rather ironic in retrospect because when Kim Philby was in college in 1933 in Cambridge, England, Cambridge University, he became a member of spy service for the Soviets. Mm. So from 1934, so he's a, a Soviet spy, an agent, as I said earlier, mm. being a, so eventually being a civil servant for the British intelligence service. Mm -hmm. He rises in the British intelligence service until he's seen as uh, perhaps the per next person to become head of it. Philby and Angleton work together across the Atlantic. In 1949, Philby is put in charge of all relationships between British and American intelligence services for the Brits. And then he's revealed to have communist friends. Uh-oh. That's always trouble. That was trouble, yes. So two of his friends, Donald McLean and Guy Burgess, who are diplomats, disappear. Mm. And Guy Burgess have, had been renting a room, have, uh, have been living in Philby's house in Washington. Mm. And people say, he's a friend of yours, and he's mm. a spy, and you're very important in the British Intelligence Service. Maybe you need another career. Uh-oh. So he's fired. Wow. This upsets Angleton because he finds out that, that one of his best friends and his teacher is a spy. Wow. So, this is the ultimate spy games. Yeah. <laughs> so then you go from about 1950 51 to 1962, where Philby's knocking around, and all the time Angleton is trying to catch him. Hmm setting traps, having people watch him, and so forth. In 1959, the old boys, the folks who have been friends of Philby's in MI6, say, we've got to take care of you, Guy. And they get him a job with the Economist newspaper and the Observer newspaper, and they send him to Beirut mm. to be the Middle Eastern correspondent. He does that pretty well. And it's a strange situation where Almost all the news that the British public get from the Middle East in those years is from Kim Philby mm. as a journalist. So he writes these stories, which are very nice kind of mm -hmm. political analysis stories, gives a copy to The Economist, gives a copy to The Observer, gives a copy to MI6, gives a copy to KGB. So he had a lot of carbon paper they were using writers at that time. Eventually, everybody decide, the Brits and the Americans decide that this is not going to work, and they try to get him to confess. Mm. And just before, the night before he's supposed to confess, by coincidence, there's a Russian freighter in the harbor at Beirut, and he goes down there, he's picked up, goes to Moscow. So he was bad? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. And he becomes... A trainer for KGB spies. Wow! In Moscow for the rest of his life, almost. 
So now this explains why they're enemies then. They're yeah. total, so meanwhile, total Angleton is rising through what becomes the CIA. Mm -hmm. And he goes back and he thinks about what's happened. Before Philby was revealed, they had collaborated on a number of things. There was an mm -hmm. attempt to overthrow the government of Albania. And oddly enough, everybody who was sent to Albania to work on this got killed. Oh, wow. And there was a project to overthrow the Soviet-inspired government in Poland. And oddly enough, everybody who was sent over there got killed. Mm. And Angleton thinks, the common denominator here is my friend Kim Philby. Wow. The one guy. So for then, years after that, after Philby had gone to Moscow, whenever anything went wrong with the CIA, Angleton said, this must be Kim's work. Wow. And he got kind of nervous. Wow. But he's rising up in the CIA. He was a very good bureaucrat. They're both very smart. Angleton was smarter, actually and very highly educated. So he's rising up in the CIA and he's given various top secret, what they always call special projects. One was they set up an operation at the airport in New York where all the international mail came through and the CIA intercepted every piece of international mail and opened it and read it. Oh. And then they had a similar operation with telegrams. So if you, in those years, 52 to 70 or something, if you sent a letter to your uh, grandmother in Belgium, the CIA has read it. Oh, wow. If you send a telegram to your banker or your stockbroker in London, the CIA has read it. Wow. And that was Angleton's work. Wow. Uh, can they um, still do that? Well, they probably can. They can do whatever they want, really. When Kennedy was assassinated, as you probably know, there were a lot of stories about who did it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't and, me. And it was very important to the CIA that nobody thought that the CIA did it. Mm -hmm. So they made Angleton the liaison with the Warren Commission. Oh, wow. And his job was to say, it wasn't the CIA, it was the Cubans, or it was the mob, the mob did it. Now, doesn't that seem a little suspect, though? If you're working that hard, thou dost protest too much, as Shakespeare used to like to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. All right. Well, I've always thought that the grassy knoll had, was very crowded. There had lots and lots of people <laughs> on it who were trying to assassinate Kennedy. Too soon. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing. It's such a horrible event in American history, but, you know. What it was. Whenever there was a need for somebody to do a special project, Angleton did it. Oh, wow. Finally, in 1972, he got into a fight with the new director of the CIA, Bill Colby, who fired him. Oh. Wow. And which seemed clear to Angleton that that meant that Colby was spy, obviously. Oh. And then he retired. Oh. This is a quite the uh, interesting times. The CIA, the director of the CIA, and how those the CIA worked. I, when I grew up, I remember uh, reading about the Bay of Pigs. I think it was 1,000 Days by Schlesinger. Uh, right. Salinger? So. Um, the, and how the CIA was whole with the Bay of Pigs and that whole thing. And it's interesting how the fingers that have been in the pies over all the years and, and different governments, Pinochet and stuff that we've tried to muck about with. But uh, this is really spyware stuff. Do you see this uh, becoming maybe a movie and spies or something? Because everyone loves uh, spy somebody movies. Somebody wants to make a movie, that would be nice. Sure, there you go. Yeah. There you go. British yeah. versus American intelligence. That might be, would that be a kind of a premise for this, maybe? Yeah, something like that. One of my favorite movies was The Russia House. And that was kind of Americans versus the Europeans with their thing. That was a good movie because that tension in that movie was awesome. So this would make a great movie too. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what other things do you want to tease out to readers to get them to pick up this baby? Well, there's the, the story about son, fathers and sons and the lingering influence of fathers over sons. Mm -hmm. uh, they both of them, well, when Philby went to Beirut doing this newspaper job, his father had retired, more or less, from helping mm -hmm. the Saudi Arabia, the Saudis, and was living there. So the two of them used to go along 
All these people, by the way, were alcoholics. <laughs> yeah, mostly, an alcoholic too. Most of the British and American government, as far as I know, were alcoholics in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. I don't know how, well, we know how things went. <laughs> anyway, the, there are stories of Kim Philby and St. John Philby getting drunk and, and going through the streets of Beirut singing English public school songs. That's probably something I do. Yeah. <laughs> it's, probably, it's probably up my alley. Right there. So this is should be a pretty interesting book. It's going to come out on October 5th. And uh, traitors, MI6, CIA, Cold War. Do the CIA and the MI6 get along back then? Do they get along now? How does that whole thing work? Do they Are they looking each other over whatever, watching each other's backs sort of thing or whatever? Well, officially they get along. One of, one of the things that Angleton did was he set up a, a coalition of secret intelligence services mm -hmm. called, called the Five Eyes which mm -hmm. is the British, the Americans, the Canadians, the New Zealanders, Australia. So the, there's a lot of connections at the secret level. Angleton thought that the split between the Soviet Union and, and China in the 1960s was a fake because he knew that their secret intelligence services were still working together. Nice. That's nice. True. And you can see this going on. Actually, there's a news story today that's a related issue that mm -hmm. the chief of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the last days of the Trump administration called up his opposite number in China and they made a deal about how to, do, how to work together in a period that seemed to be very unstable. Wow. And no one knew that until this morning. And I imagine that the head of the CIA did the same, has the same kind of relationship with the heads of all the other secret intelligence services around, whether or not they seem to be officially friends or enemies. That's crazy, man. That's crazy. So it's going to be an interesting book. It's going to launch. Uh, any last words before we go out that you want to tease out? Be careful. Be careful. <laughs> Check out the book, guys. It's going to be coming out October 5th, Spies and Traitors, Kim Philby, James Angleton, and the friendship and betrayal that would shape MI6 and CIA and the Cold War. Thanks for being on the show, Michael. We certainly appreciate it. Thank you. Give us your plug so people can find you on the interwebs or wherever you want them to order up the book. I think you can just look in the usual place if you look for books. Thank there you. you go. There you go. Thanks, Manus, for tuning in. Go to youtube.com for chess Chris Foss. Hit that bell notification. Go to goodreads.com for chess Chris Foss. See everything we're reading and reviewing over there. Go to uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all those different places. You can see our stuff there. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you guys next time. So we're excited to announce my new book is coming out. It's called Beacons of Leadership, Inspiring Lessons of Success in Business and Innovation. It's going to be coming out on October 5th, 2021. And I'm really excited for you to get a chance to read this book. It's filled with a multitude of my insightful stories, lessons, my life, and experiences in leadership and character. I give you some of the secrets from my CEO entrepreneurial toolbox that I use to scale my business success, innovate, and build a multitude of companies. I've been a CEO for, uh, what is it, like uh, 33, 35 years now. We talk about leadership, the importance of leadership, how to become a great leader, and how anyone can become a great leader as well. So you can pre-order the book right now wherever fine books are sold, but the best thing to do on getting a pre-order deal is to go to beaconsofleadership.com. That's beaconsofleadership.com. On there, you can find several packages you can take advantage of in ordering the book. And for the same price of what you can get it from someplace else like Amazon, you can get all sorts of extra extra goodies that we've taken and given away. Uh, different collectors, limited edition, custom made numbered book plates that are gonna be autographed by me. There's all sorts of other goodies that you can get when you buy the book from beaconsofleadership.com. So be sure to go there, check it out, or order the book wherever fine books are sold.